yeah all right uh so hi everybody uh i think uh this was the original uh title i had planned actually it was more like this but i think that's the extent of the memes that i have so uh yeah so this is a talk that i have been meaning to give for a while uh so i like to make things work from scratch and i think sometimes that allows me to learn things that i otherwise may not so uh i think the idea is that i want to share some of these things and i hope that they can help you as well so one thing to note is that i am not suggesting that you make a engine of your own especially if it's a big project that you're working on unless you're comfortable as a programmer the same way that i wouldn't suggest that you make your own art unless you're an artist or your your own music unless you're comfortable as a musician so that's just something i want to get out there but also i think that whenever this topic comes up there are two camps one camp says like why would i ever want to make my own engine that sounds terrifying and horrible and the other camp thinks okay that that actually sounds really cool but maybe i'm a bit scared so to the second camp i'd like to say it's it's still really not that hard uh, and it can be a lot of fun so maybe you can try it but also like this is not a talk about code or how to structure an engine or anything very technical it's much more a design focused talk but uh, through the lens of the technology that i test right uh, so this is a game it's called konkan course pirate solutions and it's a cozy puzzle game about helping pirate ships do pirate things it released early last year and amongst other things it was made in an engine that i coded from scratch so of course from scratch is uh, relative it just means that i didn't use uh, an engine like unity or unreal but i used the underlying tools like opengl and sdl and those kinds of things uh, and at around the time i released it i also had made a video about some of the things that i learned but that at that time it, it was quite rushed and i really, really didn't have time to think about the things that i had learned so uh over time i think i've developed a better understanding of some of the benefits and just also more about the things that i've learned over that time right so this is uh my attempt to try to share some of that so we'll we'll go through some examples of things that an engine gives you versus what uh you can possibly try to do from scratch so for the first example we'll have a playing sound so an engine will give you something like this api right it might be this or it might be some trigger or it might be some drop down where you select the sound file but basically uh to the extent that the user cares they just uh know the timing and the file name uh of the sounds that they want to play for the most part right uh, but if you want to go a little bit deeper then this is one api that you could use so mini audio is uh an audio api and it gives you this thing called fill pcm buffer right so when you start off you're like okay uh, what what is a pcm buffer i don't know so it just gives you a buffer is like basically an array it gives you some memory and asks you to fill it and at that point when you first look at it at least when i first looked at it I was like okay what am i supposed to even put in here and then you go one level deeper right you ask the question like what is sound in the first place right so uh like fourth fourth standard physics it's vibrations in the air and how do you create sound so you vibrate the speaker so i mean i just even uh, to that extent i thought it was very interesting that the way that uh, sound like a speaker works is that you literally vibrate it at the sound that and to create the kind of frequencies that you want to create which i thought was pretty interesting right so in this example we are going to make a sine wave and uh, this is obviously uh, zoomed in but generally you'll have around 44000 samples per second so you can fill it with uh, in with a wave like this so in this case i'm saying that each of these is a number between 0 and 1 and uh, if it's it can be positive or negative and and based on where it is at each uh, instant the like effectively the speaker will see okay uh, at this point i should move to this position this position this position this position so and so as it moves uh, over time It it reads each value and then it uh, moves forward and backward, and that's what creates uh, sound from the speaker, right? And I, I, I still whenever I think about this, I think it's a very uh, 
powerful idea because it comes from such a like we're so used to these high level abstractions but when you break it down this is what the speaker is actually doing and i think just knowing that gives you a real appreciation for the kind of technology that we use and the kind of uh things that we can create so uh if you are implementing some kind of audio of your own uh first you have to do mixing so mixing in this case uh, at least the way i see it means like if you have two sounds what do you do such that uh both of them play right i mean like this is one sound so what happens with the other sound and you have one uh longer wave and one shorter wave uh based on frequency you can uh use other words but basically uh you just add them both up in place and for me that was both the first idea and it sounded insane because uh you look at the data and it's like so convoluted and then the thought of adding these up just made no sense to me but then i realized that that's what actually happens in nature right if there are two sources of sound uh the vibrations in the air do interact in this way such that uh effectively their uh amplitudes are added up with each other and the second like one step after that it's it's so fascinating that we have evolved and we can actually hear these things right we can hear patterns in this like cacophony of noise there's so much data but our hearing systems are so uh developed that we can actually pick out different things within this right so like when i'm speaking it's just creating these uh vibrations in the air and uh, there's a, there are other noises around me and around you but you can still kind of uh figure out what you're listening to and then process that data and and they just it really gives me an appreciation for the kinds of things we can do similarly we can do stereo sound so uh in the pre like basically what you can set up the uh, api to do is to give you two buffers right one for your left ear and one for your right ear and then you can try playing around and putting different things in these so uh you can for example make your left ear louder and your uh right ear less loud and that just immediately gives you a sense that the sound is coming from your left similarly you can delay one sound from the other and again uh like the raw data that you are inputting is is this fairly uh like verbose and like large chunks of data but our ears and our, our bodies and our brains immediately just pick that up and give it meaning and i just think that's like again like really fascinating and similarly you can do things like filtering in this case i tried things like uh speeding sound up slowing it down uh then i tried to do high pass and low pass filters but then i realized that those are actually way more complex than just this so uh again like it it teaches you what actually sound is and the way that our hearing works is so uh refined that we can do a, a, a really a lot right so out of this the main thing that i got was this right i got a real appreciation for how how we process audio that there's uh, i think we uh, yeah so i think as people at, at least for me it's uh, we give the visual sense a lot of uh, importance because i think uh, a lot of reasons for that but uh, essentially like we we all process information mostly by reading and by looking at each other and things like that but uh, just the amount of data that your ears can process like like sound files are actually like incredibly complicated data and especially if you have different things playing at the same time but our ears are actually really good at differentiating between those things and picking out the important things so i think that uh, it really gives gives you an appreciation for how you can use hearing as uh, to give uh, information or senses or things like that which uh, video cannot really capture and yeah just all the possibilities that this creates right we can uh, do a lot of things with just this if if we uh, expand our like so this expanded my understanding of how what sound is and how it works and how we perceive sound and and it just like gives me a lot of ideas uh so that was the first example uh, the second example is uh rendering so you'll have something uh, some api similar to this you'll have a, a render function or each component you will tell it what the thing is supposed to render and things along those things whereas if you go for a lower level approach you will uh have an api that looks something like this uh in this case it's opengl.swap window and swap window is specifically just the final thing that calls the rendering but uh, a lot of stuff goes in before this so yeah let's just understand how a regular graphics pipeline works uh so 
first you have data right you have the thing that you want to draw on screen so in in there are two possibilities one is it's a vector representation so you uh, have each shape you tell uh, okay this is a triangle and these this is where the vertices are and this is the what color it is and similarly for each shape or you can go for a sprite approach uh, or like a, a png where uh, you just give it uh, a texture like you give it an image file and you tell this is the size and this is the location of the image and i want to draw this right so that information first gets passed to what's called the vertex shader and the vertex shader basically takes what you want to uh, draw on screen and it puts it to the location on screen uh, based on your camera, your zoom, where it is, how far it is. So uh, you rather than having to update all of these all the time, like the positions of all of these, you just tell the vertex shader roughly that uh, my camera is here, my zoom is here, like, and then it will automatically put it on the screen in the correct location. And then it will calculate all the pixels that lie within the triangle and that gets passed onto the fragment shader, right? So the fragment shader essentially for each pixel in the triangle, it will fill in the color details or it can draw and it can also be from a texture. So if you're doing the vector approach, it'll probably be a color. And if you have sprites, it'll, it'll load the texture in. And uh, somewhere between here, we also check for overlaps, which means that uh, in, in the case of this boat, suppose we draw the sail first and then we draw the bottom part of the boat. Uh, the Somewhere in this system, it, it, it knows that the sail needs to come above so it doesn't draw these pixels that are hidden behind. And finally, uh, you have your display on the screen, right? Uh, through this whole step. So uh, this is what the boat would look like. But actually, in, in my game, the boat doesn't look like that, right? It it actually has a bit more to it, right? So uh, this is how it finally looks in game. Like you can see that the sails are like moving in the breeze. There is the water shadows are also kind of bobbing up and down with the uh, water. And this is done by essentially giving extra data. So I say for this pixel, uh, I mean, for this vertex, uh, I want it to move along this line in this direction. So uh, then the system understands that and it can add more uh, data to this and, and make that happen, right? So uh, basically what I do is uh, the data along with what I used to pass in before, I also pass in which direction each vertex has to move in. And similarly, uh, the vertex shader, rather than just translating it to a position on the screen, I can also add some uh, noise to it so that it looks like it's moving, right? And uh, along with that, there's also other things that I do. So suppose uh, the boat is turning and it's going from this position to this position, then rather than just uh, flipping the sprite, I have this uh, function where it essentially smoothly interpolates between the two positions, which is again something I can do because I have the whole of the pipeline under my control. So enables uh, these kinds of things. So uh, I think the, the benefit for me for this game was mostly like unique visuals. I think uh, whatever you think about the quality, uh, I can comfortably say that it really stands out. The way the game looks is pretty unique and it has its own uh, vibe, I guess, aesthetic. And that is because I have written a graphics pipeline that I have full control over and I can do things which uh, you probably couldn't do in the standard graphics pipeline. And uh, more importantly, um, okay, yeah. so the, the second point is, yeah, play to my strength. So uh, I think most, a lot of people here can draw a better boat than I can. But since uh, I have uh, both sides of the, uh, like both the skills, the technical and the graphics, it means that I can like really play around uh, where those two overlap and really create something that looks different and that maybe nobody else can make uh, things in that same way. And yeah, just like, I feel that this approach for me adds adds more life to the visuals rather than having to create uh, like flipbook animations or anything like that. Uh, I have a system itself which can keep creating these uh, uh, animations and I, and I can tweak it to make it look exactly how I want. Right, so that's uh, rendering. So now the third example is uh, another, uh, this is, a bit of a cheat because I'm not. I wasn't making a, a 2D platformer, uh, but you can imagine that uh, if you are making something like a 2D platformer, you will import uh, a, a, a system that the engine provides, or something from the asset store, or something along those lines, which uh, does all the uh, 2D player controls for you. Uh, and 
if if you're not doing it that way then you would you would have to write code on your own right so in this case you would say something like uh when 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 jump is pressed the player velocity set it to uh minus 50 so that like starts moving up and then moving down again so yeah let's let's just try out how that works so uh you are this player and you have to jump over these spikes so then okay you move forward you press jump uh you jump over and you land and then okay that's cool uh let's try that again so yeah you move forward you jump you're in the air you press jump again okay then you jump again right and and um there is something like i think anybody who's tried to make a platformer of their own has accidentally done this or purposely done this right because uh it's just such a natural mistake to make and but what comes out of it is something so surprising and so uh like deep and beautiful right because sure like right now double jump is a common enough mechanic that you can probably have it in any 2d controller that you look for but the idea is not specifically about double jumping the idea is that uh you got a mechanic out of like accidentally discovering it on your own right you di you did something and the the computer followed the things that you told it to do but you either overlooked something or it gave you something that you didn't expect and that adds more to your design capabilities than having somebody else design that whole system for you right so in this case let's say uh, this was the original code when you press jump uh, the player velocity set uh, so you'll have to change that so you'll, you'll make it something like this right if press jump and can jump then set the velocity uh, but then the question comes what is can jump right so maybe you can say okay when the player hits the ground then can jump is true right so then like you have most 2d platformers like mario and stuff that's how they do right when when you land then you can jump again uh maybe if you jump once right this is the double jump we were talking about uh like one example is uh super mario you where you can jump again when in the i think <laughs> i'm not 100 sure about this actually but yeah the third one is let's say there's a there's something in the air like a crystal or something floating in the air and you hit that then you can jump again right uh so celeste does something similar to this uh but also like maybe when the player bounces off something which again celeste does or they move to the next screen which again celeste does which which means that uh like we've taken this one uh mistake like in this case like i mean this is obviously a story but you can imagine a story where uh you find one interesting thing like this and you build a whole game around it right like you say that when can you dash or when can you double jump and then you design mechanics around that you design a game around that and the whole question was asked only because uh you were going through the effort of trying to make something on your own so yeah like uh all of game design in my opinion is is this right answering this question like what is can jump and all of the answers that you can come up with can give you completely different games from each other right and more than just uh this like every every time you reach you have an accident or you make something uh by mistake uh, mistake is in double quotes obviously uh where you you make something and uh something unexpected happens and then you can kind of lean into that right so that is in my opinion uh, a very strong case again like as i said uh double jump is one example but you can imagine that every other game has these moments where uh something unexpected happened and then that led to even more uh better designed and deeper exploration of mechanics yeah so uh these are the three uh, examples that i have given uh so like one is a custom audio engine one is custom rendering and one is custom gameplay so if if you're making custom audio like i would honestly recommend don't do, not to do this because a, it's a very deep field and it's very complex and also i think it's fairly well explored right uh, you look at something like fmod or something that uh, uh other engines give you they give you a lot and at least the to, to the extent that i have seen they cover a lot of things that uh manually doing it will not necessarily add any more uh depth to your game of course unless <laughs> there's always an unless unless you're making a game where audio like uh, manipulating audio on your own is important and you have some you want to do something that uh something like fmod or unity cannot do right so that's the obvious caveat so the second thing is a rendering engine i think everyone should learn all about this uh, to understand all of the capabilities that their engineering and uh, that their engine has and it need not even be to learn vulkan or open gl right even if it's just within unity within godo just see everything uh, that the engine offers right because you can understand in each of them if something uh, strikes your interest or can 
allow you to do things in a new way that is always to your own benefit and even if not just understanding the your tools better is always going to be good for you and help you on uh, in your journey so that's what i suggest like make sure that you know everything that your engine offers and then uh, if you are interested in, in in this exploration dot then try that out also right so understand what is the uh, graphics pipeline what are the different things that it can do things like that the third is a custom gameplay engine and i'd say don't skip this uh, and again when i say that i don't mean uh, write your own code i i mean again like uh, it's more more than custom code it's it's like it's a custom mindset right so that if if you are in using an engine try to do the same thing in different ways right don't just uh, take the first thing that's given to you try out the whatever different nodes like if it's a kinematic body make a static body or <laughs> all of that i'm not too sure about the details but uh, try out different things and see what happens right see uh, what are the interesting things that can come out of that by uh, looking at the same problem in a different way and uh, unless of course like you know what your game is about then don't try to do this in other uh, aspects right like so for example if, if you're making return to abroad in then there's no need to write your own uh, 3d character controller because i mean that's well understood and that's not what the game is about right so make sure that whatever uh, you think your game is about uh, the core part of it you are exploring on your own and trying out different things trying it out in different engine trying out all the different ways that your engine allows you to trying it out on your own and all of these ways right so uh, that like brings me to a philosophy that I am trying to prescribe to. So like the question is what makes the medium of game special, right? So this is something that I think about sometimes. And for me, the, the, one of the answers is interaction that, uh, most other artistic mediums have very little to no interaction. And, uh, whereas games, uh, allow you to do, to interact how much ever you want. Right. So this is like my favorite example, but, uh, this toothbrush example, it, it, like if you played it, you'll know, but. Uh, there's a game where in one scene you have to place a toothbrush in a toothbrush cup holder and that's like the most emotional moment I've had in all the games I've played, right? And the reason it's so emotional is because you've been interacting with all of these other objects and uh, moving them around and like it's been a task. Whereas when this finally comes to this moving this object around, all of the interactions in the past have kind of primed you to think in a certain way and this like is, is a really emotional moment. Uh, and the second thing that makes game special is exploration, which means that you can really explore, right? It could be worlds, like you say, like uh, Legend of Zelda, where you, you can go, you don't know what's around each corner and there's something always special there. Or it could also be systems where uh, you're allowed to explore things in uh, which you could otherwise never explore. Right? So in this case, let's just ask, like, what, what even is a system, right? So one example that I'll take is that like every person has many names uh, by that i mean that uh, i call my mom mom but my dad will not call her that and her dad will not call her that, and so on right so based on who is uh, speaking to you the name that they have for you will be different uh, similarly like some cultures have these naming conventions which is like for example that uh, you the father and the son have the same name right so that's why you have like junior and senior or the first and second third and exam uh, stuff like that so uh, that's again like that is something that's there. Then like families have secrets, which means that uh, maybe they're embarrassed about something or they've hidden something and everyone doesn't know, but some people know. And there's like this information asymmetry, which means that uh, depending on whom you talk to, they might know more or less or might know not of of, of the thing that you're asking about. And uh, finally, if you see where this is going, uh, being related by blood can have specific, specific significance, but like in the case of like maybe medicine or even like uh, legally, it could have uh, different implications and like all of these together form a system, right? Of understanding who is who and what is what. And uh, this game, The Root Trees Are Dead, it's a great game. I really suggest that you give it a shot. Uh, explores these systems, right? Because it, it, it asks all of these questions and, and you have to think about all of these. Like these are realized systems that exist in the world. And uh, this game presents uh, avenues for you to explore these questions through. So the next question is what makes video games uh, special, right? So I think uh, Root Trees Are Dead could have been made in different formats. It need not have necessarily been an interactive video game. Uh, so again, it's the, the answer is the same. It's interaction, interaction and exploration, but specifically of like of abstract systems, right? So the the naming system was something uh, which is like present in the world, but not so abstract. So what is an abstract system? So like game rules, for example, can be considered an abstract system. So like these are rules you all probably are familiar with. Like you can move boxes around in a grid. 
uh, only one thing at one time occupies one cell in the grid. And if you push into a box and it has space to move, then the box gets pushed. Right? That this is like Sokoban, basically, uh, like three rules, roughly. I think, I don't know if it's mathematically complete, but roughly these are the three rules of Sokoban. So yeah, so here you have this case where uh, you're trying to push this box down. But since there's a rule that says, uh, unless this space is empty, you can't push it down, right? Okay, cool. This, this is the second one though. Uh, so now the box is against the wall, which means you can't push it. Uh, you can push it up and you can push it down, but you can never get it off the wall. Like this was not explicitly stated in the rules, but what those rules led to is this scenario where uh, if, if any time a, a box is pushed against a wall, it cannot be taken out, right? And this is the third one where if you put a, boss, a box in a corner, it just cannot be removed, right? No matter what you do, if you go here, you go here, you push down, you push, uh, push right, push left, uh, whatever happens, you cannot move this box out, right? And these rules when, uh, like these specific things were never mentioned in even the rules, right? Probably if you think a lot about the rules, you can kind of, uh, intuit them or extract them or, uh, derive them, but, uh, it's not something that the rules came up with, right? It's, it's something that kind of emerges from the rules, right? So. These are like, you can call them mechanics that emerge from between the rules uh, or from in general emergence can uh, come from between mechanics, right? So for example, in, in the uh, jumping example, uh, the gravity is a mechanic and jumping is a mechanic, right? And double jump is something that comes out of both of those things because uh, without either of those, you could not have this concept. Similarly from within formal apps, like uh, in this case, uh, the game rules, uh, but like there are other examples and uh, this is like i think the underlying thing that these emergence come from some complexity that exists in the universe and we can create abstract systems that then explore this uh these concepts and like i'll go into this further a bit you know so again the question is like what makes the medium of video game special so for me it's specifically interaction and exploration of, of emergent mechanics right when you have systems and you can explore them and interact with them and create things that are new and surprising and joyful and things like that, which is, uh, something that only this medium can give us. Right. And no other medium can do it in the same way. And, uh, because you can be told everything, all the rules about a system and still there's always going to be surprising bits and uh, pieces hidden amongst that, right. Which emerge from the sum of the whole and not from any one single part. So yeah, like, oh, where is, where does emergence come from? I think this is like, again, almost a philosophical question, but, uh, it's somehow in the nature of the universe, right? Like, I don't think we understand it necessarily, but we understand that it exists, right? So like simple systems, uh, interact to create complex systems, right? If you look at, uh, the universe, uh, uh, like physically, there are, there's this one thing which can either be. It can either be energy or it can be matter. And there are these few forces that act on that. And then from that you get uh, matter and then you get atoms and then you get molecules and then you get planets and you get solar systems and galaxies and stars. And then similarly at a lower level, you get uh, like chemical compounds, then you get life and then you get sociology and then you get uh, games, right? So uh, it all, at no point does, is there like a DLC in the universe, right? That, okay, now human beings have been unlocked, pay, pay $2 and then you can unlock video games, right? That, that, that's not how it works. Like all of these, the rules that have been put in place are just keep interacting with each other and keep building up more and more complex things. And, and, and that's how, like, at least my formulation of the universe works that, uh, there is some nature there that creates emergence and that's what everything is. So if we, if we look at another example, like let's say you have these blocks and, and you stack them like this, uh, <laughs> for some reason. So yeah, I mean, if, if you release it, then they're all going to fall, right? So similarly, if you stack another stack on the other side, these are also going to fall, right? But once you put a uh, stone in the middle, which is called a keystone, uh, which is, uh, the whole thing stands up straight, right? Again, like, uh, you got an arch and you get architecture and this is not a special case, right? It's not, it there's there's no code that says, Hey, look, uh, yeah, now the keystone has been inserted. Now the block shouldn't fall, right? It's, it, it comes emergent, right? It, it comes from these interactions, the rules that this block was going to fall this side, this block was going to fall this side. Now they're both going to fall into each other. And then the whole thing stands up on its own, right? And that's like, again, like something that's comes out of, of the simpler rules that already exist. Similarly, like there's this concept of high ground advantage. In fact, it's, it's like so common that 
now it's even like in use as idioms to say that okay this person has the high ground which means that they have an advantage right? and it comes from the fact that uh, when you're in at a higher elevation you can like you can see more you can see more clearly and you can you have the visual advantage and this again doesn't come from uh like it, it comes in games as well of course like in fortnite or in counter strike where if you are at an uh, elevation then you can see better and you can understand things better and this doesn't come from a code that says okay if, if your z is greater than uh this amount then you increase your field of view it, it's it's not that right it comes from like something fundamental about 3d space that means that uh being at that level you can see differently and you can see more and like again like this, that's why castles are uh, built on hills and that's why like archers are positioned at the top of the castle and that's why the crow's nest is at the top of the ship because inherently fundamentally about the about 3d space in general uh when you're at a higher ground you can see more right? and that is just something again fundamental about 3d space but another thing is a peaker's advantage so if you played uh these tactical shooters you might know about this but Basically, it has to do with uh, the the fact that information takes time to travel, right? That there is a, a speed limit of the universe, which is like the speed of light. Nothing can travel faster than that. So, by definition, uh, if something happens, like if if two people are playing a game and they're separated by enough distance, uh, one person will. Uh, it takes time for the information to go. I mean, I think uh, I'm over laboring this, but basically, this is not a mechanic that uh, the uh, developers have put into the game right they, they know all about it like uh, any good shooter will know about what is high ground advantage right if you are playing any multiple uh, multiplayer game this concept of peaker's advantage exists right but these both come from something fundamental about uh the universe that we live in right this means that if, if two people are playing the game from across the world then it does take time for one person's input to reach the other person's screen and there are different ways to deal with that right like a fighting game will deal with it differently from a, a shooter game but still like there's something fundamental about the universe that makes these mechanics i mean these uh, concepts exist and that they emerge from uh something that was not deliberately put in so uh yeah i guess the next question is uh how do at least how do i find instances of emergence right and the answer is like just exploration right you just make a lot of things make different things and smash them together and, and see what happens right and so many interaction like once you make something just go to every corner see see how it is see what it's doing see uh, what's happening and like i think this is a very interesting uh duality that exists that uh, making games and uh, finding emergence which in in my uh, uh like playing games and making games have this thing in common and i think that's, that's something beautiful about what we do so yeah i think how would you design around this concept of emergence right so the first thing is just poke around mm -hmm. a lot at least that's what like every time you see any system just go and poke around see what happens do different things and see if, if something interesting happens and then whether you can lean more into that uh yeah just be curious try out different things uh and a lot of this also just comes from uh, exploring a lot of things in different fields and uh seeing something that's interesting that uh maps across fields and that's generally like a good idea and yeah just find the interesting hotspots in these things right uh whatever you do just find that and just like poke right some of this is uh out of your control uh, because as we discussed earlier like emergence is not something you can do it just it just exists so like you have to find it and uh there are ways to to probably be better and worse at finding it but at some extent it's it's just about uh, hoping it, it works out right so uh yeah so start at least like this is my my game design philosophy uh like start with systems right make make, make some interesting mechanic or system that uh is interesting on its own and if you every new mechanic that you add needs to like interact well with all the existing things to to whatever extent you can right wherever your game is interesting and uh, i think this is the uh, point that helps me the most that whenever there are multiple options always choose the one that leads to more interactions so uh, uh, and that's why like i make things in a custom engine right because i think all of these things align with that same idea that uh, so i i can I, I give an example here which is that uh, suppose you have uh, <laughs> right so in this game uh, you uh, are going to control the ship right so basically the way this game is designed is that you start off by putting these tokens on the board so like now when you're writing the code you have to say okay this ship is going to move here what should it do so initially the idea was that um, it's going to be something like space cam right like it it sees the turn right signal here it turns right it sees a turn left signal it turns left but 
uh, when you're actually sitting and writing down this code, or uh, at least for me, when I was actually sitting and writing down this code, it was like, okay, like I've just placed this token here. There's no reason why it has to stay here, right? So then the mechanic came that, okay, let the ship pick up the uh, token that, uh, <laughs> Uh, that it just comes across, let it pick up the token, right? So now the next question. So uh, before there was a token here, but now this ship doesn't turn at all because uh, it, it's already been picked up. And that alone like brings in a lot of uh, interesting things. And the, the second mechanic is this, right? So now that the ship is going to go over here and see another token. So what should it do now? We know it's going to pick this up and watch it do the old one, right? And there are a lot of, there are multiple options again present here, but uh, the most interesting one was it, it drops it, it drops it right there. So that means that the other ship can then pick it up and then, uh, right. So, uh, right. So that's, that's the, uh, one real good idea to keep, uh, finding more interesting things, right. Just make things interact more with each other. Right. So for example, if you're, you're creating some kind of arcade or fighting game where, uh, if a character dies, what should happen to them, right? Either they can just like uh, disappear off screen or they can like uh, die in place and then then become an obstacle for the rest of the game to play around, right? And that this inherently is more interesting and it could it could work, it, it could work out, it, it might not work out, but it's still the, the fact that uh, you're creating more things to happen is, is in my opinion, like something that is most likely to lead to interesting things happening, right? So... I, I, I am not a good designer, right? But when I say that, I, I mean that when I think of a mechanic or I think of a system, I think of an idea, I have no idea if it's good. I have no idea if it's rich. I have no idea if it's going to lead somewhere. I have no idea if it's fun to play, right? Uh, in my head, I cannot think of any of these things, right? But I, I am patient. That's my strength, right? I can uh, keep tweaking things, keep seeing different things, keep, uh, and I'm fast, right? So I can make a lot of changes and explore a lot of different things, which is, uh, allows me to explore uh, more of the space. And even if I start off with an idea that's not good, I can eventually reach there, right? There's this uh, talk by this, uh, I mean, this is a uh, speech <laughs> by a person called Ira Glass, where he talks about the difference between uh, your taste and your uh, capability, right? So when you just start off in any craft, you're better at uh, seeing and understanding what is good than at actually creating good things, right? And in this case, I just like use both of those things, right? Even though I'm not good at creating the thing in the first place, I'm good at judging if something is good and then I'm tweaking it, uh, being patient, being fast, and then tweaking it all different directions and seeing if it gets better or gets worse, right? And the game will like, uh, if you allow it to, the game will become what it wants. Uh, so like you should just explore the game and see what are the different hotspots that arise and uh, see how you can facilitate the game to happen through this, right? And at least for me, <laughs> like uh, the custom en engine enables all of that, right? So uh, if it's a 2D platformer, it has to change into some other thing entirely, I can do that. Like the uh, Konkan Coast was originally a, a game about shooting arrows and recalling the arrows, but then eventually it became this game about ships and, and like nothing from the original uh, stands, but it was, it was just step by step and it was very easy to go to something very different because uh, I knew the parts that I had found interesting in that uh, bone arrow prototype and I could and I could move them around. So I think why I design games is like to explore my curiosity and these systems and making them clash with each other and trying to find out what's interesting in that is something that I find deeply valuable and I like sharing these things right like uh, when you have a one level that's like really good and really interesting and really cute I, I think that that that's like for me that really is really interesting right that uh, you find something and you find a humorous way to present it or a deep way or an interesting way to present it and i think uh that really is what it's all about for me right and, and like every other game designer like famous. so uh yeah so if if the any of these things about emergence and uh this kind of game design interests you then there's a stock by uh called truth in game design and I think it covers a lot more than I can and it goes a lot deeper and it's really interesting. And I think that uh, if anyone, if, if this sparked your inter uh, interest in the least, I think you should go and check it out because it really has a lot of interesting things to say. And yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, 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 yeah, this is, uh, you can find me here. This is the game, uh, Concurrent Coast Pilot Solutions. And like, yeah, if you have any feedback, I, I would really appreciate that. Uh, uh, yeah, so, Basically, uh, you mentioned how with this server, you're able to change the game and follow it in any direction. Are there any downsides to having few constraints and like, how do you figure out not what not to take? 
I think this is the same, like this is a scope creep question, right? It's it's not anything unique uh, to this approach, I don't think. Uh, for me, it was, uh, this is mostly happens in early, early design when I'm exploring uh, what is the game I want to make. Uh, then it changes a lot. And then once, uh, once you have, once I have what the game is about, then it's much more uh, constrained, right? So I think that uh, it is again, but again, like then the the circles of iterations become smaller. Like so, for example, in KCPS, like I was looking for a final mechanic and I had to try a lot of things before I got it. But again, uh, I think this is much more about scoping than about the particular approach. But uh, I, I mean, I and I hope at least that's how I see it. And I didn't have too many problems with that, but uh, like. Yeah, that I think that was just my experience the first time around. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think uh, uh, like I think I didn't mention this, but uh, I like so the question is, do you think you would get similar benefits without going full custom, like writing a custom input system for an existing game engine? Yeah. Like I think that uh, every thing that you do more than the minimum is gonna help, right? Like. Anything that you can explore more than uh, maybe the people around you are exploring or the people who are making similar games are exploring is a benefit. So, uh, like, I think I mentioned this, but I'll, I'll just say it again that, uh, like, if you are in Godot and uh, you created a, a system using certain components, then, like, maybe try making the same system with a different set of components that, or, or nodes, I guess, that are not necessarily meant exactly for that thing. And then just see what happens, right? I think that, uh, the journey like the value is in the journey of trying different things out because you might find something that is interesting and that allows you to uh, uh make a game that's more interesting overall possibly even very different from what you started off with. so i think that anything that you do more than the minimum is a benefit uh yeah so uh, what would you say is a good way to balance between teaching a mechanic and letter, letting a player discover an emergent mechanic, right? Uh, I I am on the uh, discovery side of this, and I think that like my game struggles a bit because very earlier on uh, in in uh, KCPS there's a uh, a mechanic that needs to be discovered, and a lot of players get really frustrated at that. Uh, but again, like I think that a lot of the discovery is for you to do as a designer. And then uh, presenting that to a player is can be done in, in all different ways. Uh, I don't think that there's a limit to, uh, or or there's, this approach even talks about that side of things. This is specifically about as a designer, what can you uh, discover, right? And uh, then once you find that, maybe you change things, maybe you don't, but uh, you can present that separately and discover it separately. I think those are two uh, things that need to be separately considered. Marcos asks, did you have to discard many levels or code after each emergent discovery? Like, yes, I had to discard a lot. But I think even if, uh, like, as, like, I'm a programmer at, at heart, so that's something that is, like, par for the course, that you'll always find a better way to do something. And then the old code is uh, not uh, a waste, but it was, like, your practice, right? It's like, if you're, when you're drawing, you have to draw like thousands of pages before you get good at it. And the first pages are just that, right? So even this is the same thing in a design space that uh, whatever you have to discard, you have to discard. But the idea is that making those things is what allowed you to get to the final place. And I think that's that's part of what happens. Uh, Goran asks, what did you write the engine in? So I wrote it in this language, it's called Zig, uh, Zigline. Uh, then I used uh, SDL and uh, OpenGL. For the graphics and uh, I think SDL for the audio and there are some other uh, libraries to load images and to load sounds but uh, yeah that's what I used but I'm not going to say that this is the best or the worst way to do it uh, but I, I enjoyed doing it this way and I did yeah. Uh, I was about to ask if you felt like Zig also allowed you to explore things better than uh, other languages might have done. I I mean, I, I can't conduct a control on that, but I think sometimes people give too much attention to uh, the language. I think if you're familiar with something it works for you, you should do it. I think even like if you're using Python or uh, JavaScript or any language, uh, uh, there are other concerns, but specifically in, in this aspect, I, I don't think that 
the language is as important as the methodology and the approach. Uh, but again, like I, I don't know, right? I, I mean, it's definitely better than C because it, it crashes less uh, and it does uh, things a little bit more uh, sanely. But apart from that, I think uh, it's not that much of a factor the way I see it. Uh, like once you're comfortable with any language, it it mostly gets out of the way. At least that's the way I do it. I don't use too many uh, uh, advanced features. Yeah, go on. So Ziglang is it's still like uh, in in technically in beta. It's not yet uh, 1.0 version, but uh, I I was using C before that, and then it it. I was struggling to build stuff and Zig has like a build system as one of its core like pillars. So I tried it out and I really liked it. Uh, and it, it, it's similar to C enough that you can do all the things that allows, but it prevents you from doing really dumb things, which is what someone like me needs. Like just uh, keep it simple. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, I think my approach is not as refined. I, I am not, uh, I don't have like a maths background and I don't think of things in, in that way. But when you say, when you talk about feeding uh, the output back into the input, I think that's what like all games do, right? Like what, like one step in a Sokoban is uh, then leads to the next step, right? Uh, I mean, I don't know if I'm saying this wrong, but, uh, and, and to me that does sound like uh, feeding the output back into the input because uh, you make a change and then you have to react to that change and then what that leads to like uh, i think chaos is, is is a little different in that case uh, maybe like marcos might be better at that because he has a lot of procedural generated stuff but uh i i have not done much stuff with uh, any chaotic systems as as a mechanic uh, but i am sure that there is a lot of interesting stuff that happens there as well right like uh, i have not done it but i'm sure that it's there because in, in my experience, everything that I've explored does have like a deep well of things to do. So, uh, I, I mean, I don't think, no, I answer that question, but, uh, I, I hope that, uh, that makes sense. Uh, how much value do you, do you find in gaining familiarity with existing solutions before create something from scratch? Uh, so I think, yeah, this is a, a two way, a two way thing. One is. Uh, I think again, like I'll, I'll reiterate, but there's, I don't, I don't know if there's value in innovating for the sake of innovating. So if, if your game is about, uh, like if your game is Firewatch and what the things you're exploring are, are narrative and, uh, are things along that, then just having a different character, uh, character controller that has like unique controls, maybe doesn't make sense. But if you're making something like Outer Wilds where uh, character control, I mean, in that case, it's like a, it's like a spaceship is, is very useful, right? Like, uh, there. It's finicky because it, it leads to something that uh, they're trying to do different. So uh, I think that uh, I, I try to make sure that what I am uh, like uh, creating on my own is what is unique about the game and not uh, everything for the sake of it. I think that uh, if, if everything is new and innovative, uh, then like it, it's, a, it's like messy and it's a soup. But if you can take that one thing that you found and make it interesting and then put it in a framework that people can play and understand, then uh, that's where I think uh, it value comes from. Like that's where you can make a, a game that is both uh, deep and people can play it. But that's again, like a, a personal thing. I think both ways work. Uh, even uh, creating everything from scratch might be useful, like having a different set of menus. Like, especially if you're playing something like VR games, then all of the existing menu solutions don't work and you have to create something new. But if you're creating a first person shooter, then like space is not jump and control is not crouch. That doesn't make sense. Uh, but I, I think, I hope that was the question you were asking, but uh, gaining familiarity for me is, is like market research, play other games to see what they're doing and, and hope that you can innovate in the correct directions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one more thing. Uh, yeah. If, if you guys have any feedback for me, please let me know because uh, like I want to get better at this sharing information and uh, sharing whatever knowledge. So if you have any kind of feedback, please let me know what you understand or didn't understand. Like, yeah, I, 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 uh, I just want to get better and everything helps. Thanks.